began to come to services. They were very regular there for quite a while, but they need to be restored. Jeff knew that. He was concerned. But I came to know Gene a little bit gradually. Gene's kind of quiet, but get to know him. And I told Jeff one day, I said, Jeff, you know, it just very well may be that he is thinking through this thing so that when he makes his mind up, it'll be a solid, solid thing. I think uh, I was right on that. Those of us here think so highly of the Litchie. We preach them, appreciate them for their love for the truth and their desire to serve God. And their growth and development has been good for all of us. Those who have known them and seen them grow, it helps us stay with it and be steadfast. Brother Gene has a good mind on his shoulders. He's a, he's a learned man, and I don't mind saying that. I, I've been blessed. Brother Dub said a while back, you don't know what you have at spring. I do, too. And I'll fight any of you to keep it. <laughs> I very much do. Uh, and I'm deeply appreciative of it. Although there was a time back there when I won. Well, that was... <laughs> I deeply appreciate the elders here and the men. You've heard what they can do. And we have a whole quarter set up on Wednesday night to where the men here deliver the talk. And I must say that you know, that's a whole quarter that eats a different one every night. And I think the elders will say they do a great job in what they do. And it's very encouraging to me personally as a preacher of the gospel to see this kind in this size congregation. And Brother Gene, just, uh, he just always puts his heart into it. See, Gene, I hear a little bit about how much work you put on this because of that um, suitable help that you have. <laughs> she tells how much work you put into it. And we appreciate the work she does here and all. And we want to hear Brother Gene. Uh, he was born in 1951 in Freeport, Louisiana. He attended uh, the public schools of Dallas. He earned a Bachelor of Science degree in Geology in 1973 and a Master of Science degree in Geology in 1975 at the University of Texas at Arlington. He also earned a split minor in Biology and Mathematics with his bachelor's degree. He spent 33 years working as an explorer, exploration geologist with several major and independent oil and gas companies while living in the Houston, Texas area. He is a certified petroleum geologist, the American Association of Petroleum Geologists, and a member of the Houston Geological Society. He is married to the former Joy Martin. They married in 1970. They had two married sons and five granddaughters, and they are well thought of members here of this congregation. I wanted to go over that, just like we did with Ken. Folks, there are folks out there that have a lot of good academic formal education, and they still have their feet on the ground regarding God and truth. And we want to, we want to push and uphold and help them when it comes to letting these people be known of what they know. Brother Gene, please come speak to us now concerning the age of the earth, young or old. Hard to see this, but uh, I want to thank the elders at Spring for uh, presenting the challenge to me today to, to give this talk. I've never done anything like this before, but I, I'm willing to try. I'm not sure I have the natural extemporaneous speaking ability that all preachers seem to have, but I'll, I'll give it a, a shot this morning. I'm sure I've assigned the topic because of my educational background, what is the age of the earth, whether is it young or old. Uh, as we go through it today, you'll find it's not, the answer is not found in science, it's found in the scriptures, and that's what I'll support my premise with today. Uh, I did want to point out that uh, Jeff's mother and I are proud of him. He's, he's, he's matured as a great young man and a great young gospel preacher, and we hope he has many years of service to the Lord. Uh, he does cast a bad, uh, big shadow sometimes, so I hope I do half as well as he usually does, and uh, I'll be pleased with that. And uh, I want to point out, too, I did bring one visual aid today. I know it's hard to see. I do have, it's kind of black and white fossil rock. Uh, I did this in the pattern of Terry Hightower. It's not quite as exotic and colorful as your uh, model bending a fly trap, but I think it will serve the purpose today. So. <laughs> uh, Again, the topic I was assigned was the age of the earth, and Dave was right. In my life, I have kind of gone through an odyssey of thinking things through and, and learning and developing, I think. Uh, 
when one begins to gather the resources for a topic like this, the age of the earth, you re realize there's been a considerable amount of data written in the past 30 years. And when I entered college as a young, immature Christian, uh, I was severely challenged by the matter-of-fact teaching of evolution in my geology and biology courses, and it did cause me to stumble at times. Uh, the only way to meet these challenges was to strengthen one's beliefs that, uh, by studying the Bible and understanding the revelations of God has given to man about his creation and his purpose for man. As recently exposed in Ben Stein's docudrama, uh, Expelled, no intelligence allowed, the concept of evolution is rampant and firmly entrenched in academics from elementary school through the university systems. I might say right now in Texas and several other states there's a big battle going on in Austin with the educational committees where in, in light of what Doug McQuish said the other day, rather than presenting biological studies as uh, presenting the, the data and letting people draw their own conclusions, they've decided to adopt, or the majority of the board is deciding to adopt textbooks in Texas that support evolutionary theory and, as fact. And that's a battle that's going on on in a lot of states right now. And there's still time, uh, I think they make that decision at the end of March, there's still time to get on the internet and contact those representatives on that board and, and express your opinions on that. Those who may believe in intelligent design or creation as revealed in the Bible are often chastised or punished for their boldness in challenging evolutionary theories. A note of caution must be issued in using intelligent design because those who may support the idea of intelligent design may not necessarily believe in the divine creation by God as it's revealed in the Bible. Uh, Bernardo said, if intelligent design is used as a philosophical argument to understand how we understand science, I have no problem with it. Some people are using it as a scientific explanation per se, but it's really not. It's a philosophical explanation trying to show the presuppositions by which we can talk about the divine purpose or providence in the world. He goes on to say, the problem I see with both sides, both those that are pushing evolution again and with intelligent design is they're really arguing philosophy. They are not arguing science, and I believe that's true. Our young people today are unwittingly programmed by educational docudramas on the History Channel, the Animal Planet Channel, the National Geographic Channel, Discovery Channel, and other public broadcasts with shows showing the origins of our planet and solar system and the currents and distributions of animal and plant life which has existed on our planet through time. Uh, a lot of shows depict uh, life such as dinosaurs using fully animated computer programs that show what they look like, how their skin appeared, even the color of their hide, or what sounds they emitted when they were given, uh, and, and they do this with minimal or little no evidence to support it. We know they once existed since we can readily find their fossil remnants in various parts of the earth. And our knowledge continues to grow with time as we discover more and more uh, fossil specimens. However, the preponderance of the evidence is from fossils do not give us the kind of detail that's depicted in these shows and is often nothing more than educated guess or wild speculation. We must question the beliefs and motives of those who make these shows as they promote evolutionary concepts. When we view them with our children, we must point out the fallacies as compared with the Bible, biblical accounts of creation and the worldwide flood during Noah's time. <clears throat> People ask me as a geologist, how can one believe in God except biblical concepts of creation and still be able to perform a job as a petroleum geology dealing with the concept of time and millions of years in the geological time scale? As it turns out, in the petroleum industry, a geologist does not have to deal with absolute time as much as with relativity of one event occurring before another. In the typical geological work that I do, it's a matter of understanding which layer of rock was deposited first in a sequence of sedimentary rocks, understanding that a sequence of rocks was deposited prior to a fault cutting across it, or understanding a sequence of sedimentary rocks were, were deposited prior to being metamorphosed or folded by high temperatures and pressures. Uh, understanding where the igneous and volcanic rocks were intruded or cut across the pre-existing rocks. All of the above deal with one sequence of, in relation to another, deciphering what events occurred first, second, and thirdly, and so on. In dealing with the timing of various geologic events, we have to consider the scale of the events we're analyzing. A large volcanic eruption is capable of putting large ash clouds in the atmosphere, and when they settle out in the atmosphere onto the land and into the oceans, 
It creates an event marker which can be traced worldwide versus a local flood and a creek down here, the Spring Creek, which is a very small area. It's not much use for correlating a worldwide event. The same can be said uh, in looking at microscopic pelag pelagic marine organisms floating in the oceans that are more likely to be ubiquitous as they are carried around the world in the ocean currents as opposed to a small group of land animals that may be living in some part of Texas. Uh, fossils from these ocean-borne organisms are more likely to be a good marker for correlating various rock groups over large areas than a more restricted occurrence of the mammal fossils, assuming that the distribution of those animals is not limited by oceanic environmental conditions such as water salinity or temperature. There is a problem when we try to assign absolute time periods from rocks and fossils. There's no denying many rocks contain various types of fossils, both microscopic and macroscopic, in various sequences and abundances. These often reflect the type of environment in which they live and the sedimentary environment in which they were deposited rather than being a strict reflection of an absolute time marker in the geologic column. In supporting evolutionary concepts, Barry said, just as astronomers found a method dividing time based upon the rotation of the Earth, so Earth historians have found methods dividing prehistoric time. He stated the search, this search has led to the development of a method for dividing prehistoric time based on evolutionary development of organisms whose fossil record has been left in the rocks of the Earth's crust. He further claimed evolution through the natural selection comprises a set of continually active processes in which events that are unique occur. These events may be used as marker points in time so that a time unit may be established as the time span from one such marker to another. He says, geology is founded upon a number of principles, and keep in, word, keep in mind the word principles, and a basic goal of geologists is the induction of such natural principles from among the masses of data that continually accumulate from observations of natural phenomena. After many principles have been established, they may be used for further interpretation of the Earth's phenomena. A geologist's task is the assembly of a picture of Earth history and the phenomena both biological and physical that pertains to it. Barry defined principles as a well-tested interpretive generalization relevant to a highly consistent relationship between certain specific facts induced from many observations and descriptive generalizations. Sounds pretty general to me. It's a general truth derived from and based upon observational data. An interpretive generalization must stand the test of repeated experiment, and observation. No principle can ever be considered absolutely and totally infallible. The best or excellent approximation. So he's saying we base everything on principles, but these principles are never 100% right. An evolutionist believes the whole Earth is a laboratory where geological and biological processes can be studied and applied to the past history of the Earth. Basic principles are deduced from these processes and applied to rocks and fossils found in the Earth's crust. The principles are subject to further refinement as additional data becomes available. However, we know in his definition of principles, Barry said no principle can ever be totally and absolutely infallible. The failure to give consideration to a supernatural creation and a worldwide flood in considering the Earth's history will result in the assumption of false principles. Charles Lyell, who published Principles of Geology in 1830, established uniformitarianism at the expense of catastrophism uh, as an accepted principle for interpreting Earth's history. Lyell founded modern, Earth, uh, modern historical geology and the concept of unlimited time he introduced to the system and, and it eventually became known as the present is the key to the past is the popular phrase that, that follows Lyell's work. Eicher noted that the key of the past statement cannot apply literally to all things. The record of life, for example, shows us a long succession of different species in the rock record, each descended from some more primitive ancestor, so that each geologic age has its own unique combination of existing species. Eicher admits that the rates of evolution and extinction of the species have varied through geologic time, so they aren't constant and that we no longer demand our Earth model that each of today's particular rates and special processes has prevailed unwaveringly through uh, past times. He further states the idea of geologic activity through 
the influence of existing physical laws carries with it the necessary condition of an immense time period. In summary, uniformitarianism teaches that we interpret the past based on the processes we observe in the present, and when we apply the time required for these processes we observe in the present, it results in long periods of time being required for the deposition of thick rock sequences we find in the geologic record. Evolutionary processes are derived from these same concepts and fail to give due consideration to the biblical concepts of a miraculous creation and a catastrophic worldwide flood drastically altering the world from the way it was originally created. Catastrophic events after alter premises of uniform monetarianism used to establish time concepts. Even the noted modern day evolutionist and atheist Stephen Jay Gould, who is now met as maker, recognized that the universal lack of transitional transitional fossils in the rock record was problematic problematic to vertical evolution of animals into a new and more complex species. Gould and Eldridge, as cited in Morris, coined the term punctuated uh, equilibrium, where rapid evolutionary changes occur in small amounts of time, separated by long periods of time with little or no change. Thus, the lack of transitional fossils found in the rock record. Perloff perceptively noted, years ago when confronted with the lack of evidence for transitional fossils and their beliefs, Darwinists responded that it takes eons of time for natural selection to develop a new species. Therefore, we couldn't see the evolution because it happened so slowly. Now Gould and company say we can't see evolution because it happened so rapidly. They believe that everything's stable and it happens at such a short burst of time there's not very little record of it. Uh, Swedish biologist uh, Lovtrup said, I believe that one day the Darwinian myth will be ranked as the greatest deceit in the history of science. When I attended college in the early 70s, I was not aware of publications challenging evolutionary and uniformitarianist concepts. However, during these years, I received a copy of a book called The Genesis Flood by the, Bibli uh, the Biblical Record and its Scientific Implications by Whitcomb and Morris, which was written in 1961. It was the only publication I encountered which offered plausible scientific support for the biblical concepts of creation and the implications of a wild, worldwide flood during Noah's time as we read about in the book of Genesis. In recent years, lectureships by several churches of Christ, such as today, have directly addressed these topics and published a number of books. Uh, various Christian apologetics groups have published a wealth of data in the form of books, tracts, and website discussions. As a scientist, I some feel like, sometimes feel like preachers and theologians bundle all scientists into one basket as evolutionists and non-believers. But there are those that are willing to consider the truth as it's presented in the Bible. Here at Spring, we have, uh, besides myself, we have a biology teacher. Ken Cohn has two sons. One's a chemist and one's a physicist. So scientists can open their minds and consider the truth. One of the most prolific publishing groups has been the Institution for Creation Research, which has attacked, uh, attacked the issues surrounding creation, evolution, and the events associated with the Genesis Flood with a preponderance of scientific, theological, and philosophical arguments. However, I must caution when you use these materials, one must be careful their Calvinistic view of the Bible and their belief in false concepts of man inheriting Adam's original sin and the belief only salvation. One of their publications in six, in six days why 50 scientists chose to believe the creation is a collection of essays from scientists of multiple disciplines such as biology, chemistry, physics, geology, and in addition to engineers and mathematicians. In the book, these scientists tell why they believe in a literal six-day creation and a young earth model as opposed to the fallacies of supporting evolutionary theories. We could spend days and fill library shelves with arguments from various scientific disciplines, mathematics, engineering, as they relate to the topic of the age of the earth, young or old. We could debate ad, uh, ad nausea the impossible mathematical probabilities of matter spontaneously evolving into living organisms or the probabilities of one type of animal evol uh, evolving into a new species or class of animals. We could debate various aspects of bio uh, biology, such as cellular growth and development, DNA patterns, complexity uh, of living organisms. Terry did a good job of that the other day, talking about the one cell 
bacterial animal and just the function of the cilia associated with that animal. We could discuss the various aspects of chemistry, such as understanding the chemical building blocks needed for life, the chemical aspects of radio age dating, uh, the composition of rocks and minerals found in the earth. From physics, we could study particle analysis, uh, studying atoms and molecules, the cosmological analysis of the origin and expansion of the universe, the laws of mass conservation, the laws of, of energy conservation. As a geolog in geology, we can argue about the age of the earth as determined by the dis distribution of fossil evidence whether they represent an evolutionary process or the results of a worldwide flood. We could discuss oceanic earthquakes and volcanic activity, the breakup of the continents, the formation of glaciers and changes in the Earth's magnetic fields with time and how they fit into the evolutionary versus the creation models for the Earth. In order to properly study, adequately understand and debate the age of the Earth, it would require an army of scientists from all the various disciplines previously, previously discussed. I must admit I found naivety on both sides of the argument when Bible, biblical scholars failed to understand all the aspects of the scientific arguments and the scientists who failed to study or give adequate credit to the biblical accounts of the creation of the universal flood. Science in the sport of Darwinian theories can erode faith and lead to atheism. However, science and religion can work together seeking to understand design and the intrinsic order found in the universe. The great scientist and philosopher Galileo said, in questions of science, the authority of a thousand is not worth the humble reasoning of a single individual. We should follow Paul's example in Acts 17, 2, as he reasoned with them out of the scriptures. And as the Lord said in Isaiah 1, 18, come let us reason together. The creation versus evolution model uh, are dramatic, the differences. The creation model involves a supernatural process which no longer is no longer active and cannot be observed since the creation process was completed. The evolutionary model requires extremely long periods of time which are not observable in a single or even several human lifespans. Therefore, neither process is humanly observable. Since we cannot observe the processes, we can only discover and study the results of those processes. It's impossible to prove scientifically any particular concept of origin to be true uh, using the scientific method of observation and repeatability. A scientific investigator looking at these, no matter how intelligent he may be, ends up relying on faith, either faith as it's seen as, as a belief in an evolutionary system or faith in uh, a belief in what the Bible tells us. The Bible defines faith as the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Morris goes on to note that evolution and creationism uh, are not true theories, as uh, I think Ken talked about theories this morning, since they cannot be tested, preferring to label them as uh, the evolution model and the creation model. He cites uh, Dobhansky uh, in describing the evolution model, and it reads this way, evolution comprises all stages of the development of the universe, the cosmic, biological, and human and or cultural developments. Life is the product of evolution of inorganic nature and man is a product of the evolution of life. Evolution is defined as a directional, as directional and essentially irreversible process occurring in time, which in course gives rise to an increased variety uh, of, par of products. Thus evolution entails a self-contained universe in which its innate laws develop everything in the higher levels of organization. Particles evolve into elements. Elements into complex chemicals. Complex chemicals into simple living systems. Simple living systems into complex life. And complex animal life into man. In summary, evolution is naturalistic. It's self-contained. It has no purpose. It's directional toward increased complexity. It's irreversible. It's universal. And it continues. The creation model involves a process of special creation creation, which is supernatural, externally directed, has purpose, it has been completed, it's directional, but it's downward toward lower levels of complexity since the original creation was perfect and has since been running down. The creation model thus postulates a, a period of special creation <clears throat> in the beginning in which all the basic laws and categories of nature, including the major kinds of plants and animals, as well as man, were brought into existence by a special creative and integrated process 
which are no longer in operation, Hebrews 11.3. Once completed, the creation was placed in a conservation mode to sustain and maintain the system created, Hebrews 1.3. The once perfect creation is now headed toward disintegration as it begins to decline as man's sin violating the Creator's laws and death and decay was introduced into the system, Hebrews 1.11. The creation model has God creating a world fully prepared to sustain a fully developed man, Adam, along with the rest of the plants and animals that he created. Both the creation model and the evolutionary model require a first cause, something which puts the process in motion. The evolution asked, evolutionist asked the creationist, where did God come from? The creationist asked the evolutionist, how did matter come into the existence? The evolutionist must believe in some kind of uncaused first cause. The evolution must believe that matter has always existed in some primitive form as coming to existence from nothing, such as proposed in the Big Bang Theory, which suggests that matter evolved into its present form far back in observable time when some primeval explosion converted energy into matter. The creationist believes in a supernatural creator has always existed. Christ claims in Revelation 22:13 as part of the Godhead, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, and the first and the last. In Exodus 3:14, God said unto Moses, I am that I am. Thou shalt say unto the children of Israel that I am hath sent you. This implies God has always existed and will continue to exist. It also testifies to his omnipresence, his omnipotence, and his omniscience. Revelation 10.6 tells us God is the creator of all things, including the concept of time, and there will be a point where time will no longer exist. Both the creation and evolution models have serious religious, moral, and social implications. Evolutionary theories have gained acceptance in science communities and also the rest of the world because if man can eliminate the concept of a creator and not accept his story of divine creation and rebuild it to man, then he can also do away with his absolute moral laws and take a purely naturalistic or humanistic approach to life. When one understands he is a created being who is loved by his creator, then his innate longing for purpose in his life from both a spiritual and a moral sense can be satisfied. When he submits his will to God and follows all his commands, he ultimately will spend eternity in glory with his creator. <coughs> as one begins working on a manuscript such as this, it seems like I'm plagiarizing, cannibalizing all the various sources of data that are published, but I soon realize that the, I'm taking the same journey many others have traveled in seeking truth. If one has a good and honest heart, as we read about in Luke 8, 15, diligently seeks the truth, Matthew 7, 7, understands the scriptures are given by inspiration of God, 2 Timothy 3, 16, and is willing to study to show yourself approved of God, a workman that needs not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2, 15, then absolute truth is attainable. Christ said, if you continue my word, then you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. There are many people who read the creation account in Genesis perfectly willing to accept it on the basis of Bible authority and never question it. Others have an innate sense, and I think I'm one of those people as a scientist who need to ask questions and find answers to completely understand. Questions such as, does God exist? Can we know he exists? Did he reveal himself to man? Did he create the universe and all that is in it? How did he create the universe? Did he speak everything into existence or did he establish fundamental laws of nature and allow everything to evolve on its own? What is the purpose of his creation? How old is the creation, which is ultimately the topic of the hour today, the age of the earth? A diligent effort to search scripture, we can find the truth is required, that is required for man to completely understand the few, full beauty of God's creation and his divine scheme of redemption for mankind, John 7:52 and Acts 17:11. The answer to the question about the age of the earth, whether it's young or old, is mutually exclusive. The earth is either young or it's old. It can't have it both ways. Although we've discussed some of the scientific aspects of the age of the earth, the substance of this paper will be read in evidence from biblical scriptures. In studying geology in various parts of the world, it's obvious the earth has been through a great deal of change and upheaval. Even within our own lifetimes, we see constant erosion, the earth battered by wind and rain, tornadoes, hurricanes, sculpted by polar ice sheets, uh, modified by earthquakes, tsunamis, seeing both lands created and destroyed by volcanoes, 
and even catastrophically changed by extraterrestrial sources such as meteors and comet impacts. Have studied, having studied subsurface geology and seismic occurring miles in the Earth in various parts of the world, it's obvious that there are evidences that all the above have been occurring through time. We can even observe some of these processes that have occurred on other planets and moons. Of course, the question arises, was the Earth created with the appearance of ice or did it evolve through eons of time? There are places in the world where the rocks look older than other places. As a geologist, I'm innately curious about the nature of the Earth and seek the answers to very pro various processes that have caused this to happen. When we find a rock tank containing a fossil like this, we can study its empirical uh, characteristics of the rock that's surrounding the fossil, as well as the fossil structures found in the rock. We can describe them. We can tell you what color it is, what the texture is, the crystallography, the chemical composition. We can make slides looking under the microscope. We can look under the electron microscope and tell you all about the rocks and the elements and the minerals that are involved. We can look at the fossils and see that it did represent some type of ancient life. We can see chambers where the animals lived and where they built bigger and bigger chambers as it grew larger and moved out. There's no denying that this exists. What's it take to get a fossil? A fossil is an animal that dies, is quickly buried, and then is protected in a subsurface environment so it uh, survives uh, fossilization. Uh, when we attempt to play a, apply an absolute age to fossils, we are no longer dealing with tangible empirical qualities, but assigning ages based on one's belief in a, or faith in a particular scientific or evolutionary theory. This then becomes the philosophical argument regarding origins rather than the scientific argument. Some have questioned, did God create the earth with the appearance of age and put fossils in the earth and earth strata to test man's belief in miraculous creation? I don't believe he could do that if one understands God's true nature and all its holiness and his righteousness. I believe placing fossils in the earth during creation would be a type of falsehood designed to confuse or tempt man to reach false assumptions about the creation of life on earth. Hebrews 6.18 tells us it's impossible for God to lie. 1 Corinthians 14.33 says God is not the author of confusion. And James 1.13 tells us God does not tempt man, but he is drawn away by his own lust. We are warned in Colossians 2.8, beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men and the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Evolution would, evolutionists would fall into this category following the vain philosophies of men and ignoring the word of God. When asked the question, why did God create such exotic and diverse populations of animals which we find in the fossil records, the best explanation that it further displays the grandeur of God's creation and his omniscience. It speaks to the universal death of all flesh that walked on the earth, Genesis 7, 21 through 22, and reminds us, due to the universal flood, all flesh died that moved on the earth, uh, and all, all of whose the nostrils was the breath of life. Noah was not required to carry every species of animal found on the earth into the ark, only the kinds of animals. Ham noted, for example, he didn't need to carry all varieties of dogs, just two dogs. And if you know the history of dogs, you can find that uh, coyotes, uh, dogs, uh, wolf are, are all evolved from the same, same uh, lineage in modern times. Man sometimes wants to answer the question God has chosen not to directly build to him. Deuteronomy 29, 29 tells us the secret things belong unto the Lord our God. But those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever. John 20, 30, and 31 tells us Christ lives. He performed many signs and miracles testifying to his deity which are not written in the book, the book of John, but these are written that you might believe in Jesus Christ. I think God did the same thing in presenting the creation to man. He gave us testimony of his creation through his word and adequate evidence to understand these things are true. Psalms 19.1 proclaims, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Romans 1.22 says, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were they thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened, professing themselves to be wise. I am sure some of you have visited museums of natural history and you've seen all the fossils there. And they claim that 
these things had long life periods of millions of years, and they always show the evolutionary trees of all these animals and fossils that have been found prior to man. The fact that previously mentioned fossils exist cannot be disputed. What's common factor in all these fossils? They all had to die to become fossils, and when we view these charts, uh, they place ev uh, long ages on these evolutionary trees that uh, can't be true in comparison to the Bible text. Romans 15.4 tells us whatever things were written before time were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort the scriptures might have hope. And if we study those scriptures, we will learn the truth. When we find, study the book of Genesis, we find the universe, earth, and the plants, animals, and mankind miraculously spoken into existence by the word of God, Hebrews 11.3. It was accomplished in six 24-hour days. Uh, uh, a study of genealogies in the Bible tells us that the earth is some 6,000 years old. This causes a major dilemma for the Christian. Some of us tried to satisfy both ends of the spectrum various theories that Ken discussed, like theistic evolution, the gap theory, and the day age theory. Uh, as we discussed earlier, all these theories require long periods of time to accomplish their goals and try to put creation in motion and step back and, and let natural laws exist. Furthermore, without miraculous intervention, one cannot believe in Christ and his resurrection, so why believe in theistic evolution? This is contrary to God's word we read about in the book of Genesis and disrespectful to his omniscience, omnipotence, and omnipresence. Such theories require people believing in them to have a leap of faith uh, rather than uh, accepting the word of God. Why is this old age old dilemma critical to our salvation. As we stated earlier, God created the universe and all things in it in literal six days, pronouncing it good on completion. He created Adam and Eve in the fifth and sixth day, and they were allowed to tend the Garden of Eden, eat the animal, or the uh, plants in the garden, except for the tree of uh, knowledge of good and evil. They were told if they ate the fruit of this tree, they would die. At this time, there was no death in the world. The creation was in perfect harmony. In the garden, the serpent beguiled Eve, and both Adam and Eve violated God's commandments, and God punished them as he had warned, expelling them from the garden as death and decay entered the creation. God no longer upheld a perfect creation, and Romans 8.22 tells us that since that time, we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pains until now. They fashioned fig leaves on them, and God said that wasn't acceptable, and he put animal skins on them to cover their bodies. God could have miraculously created these animal skins, but odds are that the first animal died when they took the skins as a blood sacrifice. We have a blood sacrifice covering our sins in the patriarchal, the mosaic, and the Christian system, so it wouldn't be un uh, wrong to maybe consider that two animals died to provide those skins. We've been building a case for one of the main points from this lesson. As we stated earlier, the common factor of all the fossils is that they represent dead organisms. If we believe Genesis 1 accounts, we find man existed prior to death entering the world. How can we have fossils predating man's existence if the Bible says death came into the world after man was created? Although it's not expressly stated, again, we talk about the animal skin. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm jumping a little bit. It looks like I'm running out of time like everyone else. Uh, I think one of the biggest evidences we have is that from the book of Luke that we have eyewitness accounts in Luke 1 and uh, states that in Luke 1, 2, and 3 that he provided eyewitness accounts to minister the world having a perfect and complete understanding of belief of Christ. Uh, the creation evidence Moses presented in the book of Genesis uh, gives us those eyewitness accounts. Matthew 19, 4, Christ was confronted by the Pharisees concerning marriage of a woman and her seven brothers and each brother. Christ answered and said to them, Have you not read? When you look at have you not read in the Bible, you've got to remember what Paul said, that we can read and understand the scriptures in Ephesians 3, 4. The Lord further stated, he says unto them, Moses, because the hardness of your heart suffered you to put away your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. In making these statements, Christ verifies the Genesis account of creation. From the beginning they were created male and female, not that they evolved into male and female. By referencing Moses and his writings, uh, he verifies Moses' account in the book of Genesis. He does this again in Mark 12, 26. Have you not read in the book of Moses how the bush God spake unto him, that, how in the bush God spake unto him, Moses, saying, 
I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And in Luke 17, 26, Christ confirmed the worldwide flood in the days of Noah, where we read, we read about in Genesis chapter 6 through 9. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man, that they did eat and drink, and they married wives, and they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark, and the flood came and destroyed all. And in John 5, 46, concerning himself, Christ, he said, For had you believed Moses, you would have believed in me, for he wrote of me. For if you believe me not, believe not his writings, how shall you believe my words? It's obvious Christ believed the words of Moses in the book of Genesis and the other four books written by Moses. He chastised those he taught for not knowing or accepting the things that Moses taught. And we know this is important because Christ was a wit eyewitness to creation. Uh, I'll kind of wind it down, but in the book of John, we know that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. And all things were made by Christ, and without him not anything was made. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world know, knew of him. If you look at the text in the book, you'll find that I've backed this up with logic and, and scripture, showing that not only did Christ confirm what Moses wrote in the books of Genesis, Christ, as the creator of all things, as God's instrument, was the eyewitness to all those creation accounts, so we can trust his word. As we go forward uh, in the text, uh, I provide evidence in, concerning the flood and how it fits the geologic model. And I'll go to the end in the summary, uh, and, and we'll look at, uh, we discussed the long debated question, what's the age of the Earth, young or old? I think the conclusion is that it is a young age to Earth. We understand the air answer is, the question is mutually exclusive and the earth is either young or old. We find plausible ex explanations in the scientists which support a biblical view of a literal six-day creation and evidence is for a worldwide flood in the days of Noah resulting in a young age of the earth. We've noted science cannot fully prove the creation model or the evolutionary model for deciphering the age of the earth because neither theory can be tested in the laboratory and the results confirmed by repeated experiments. Faith is required to support either model. However, in the Bible text, uh, we have adequate evidences and eyewitness testimony by the Creator Himself that the Genesis account of creation and the worldwide flood of Noah's time recorded by Moses are true. Therefore, due to the preponderance of evidence and our faith in the divine inspiration of the Bible Scriptures, we are compelled to believe the Genesis accounts of both are true. This is critical to one's Christian beliefs because if we ever dismiss any part of the Bible text as untrue, then we can dismiss, dismiss the entire Bible as the basis for religious beliefs and nullify all of God's commandments. Man must make a choice to accept evolutionary theories and the vain philosophies of men, Colossians 2 8, worshiping the creation instead of the Creator, Romans 1 25, or he must accept the creation account as revealed in the divinely inspired Word of God. As Joshua said in Joshua 24:15, Choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which are your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites and those whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Christ warned in Matthew 24, 34, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words will not pass away. And at the end of time we will be judged by those words, John 12, 48. I've often thought... If I, or when I get to heaven, I would, as a scientist in me, would like to ask Christ many questions about the creation process and the universal flood during Noah's time. But I think he might look down at me and ask me the same question he asked the Pharisees. Have you not read and believed the things that Moses, written by Moses and the prophets? Brethren, I'm just thrilled to hear, hear this kind of preaching done. And it was preaching. And I don't know where, although I think some people like to make light of it, but I don't know where people think preachers come from. They come out of congregations like this. They're people who've got enough concern and love for the truth and zeal and desire for the Lord's cause that they want to stand up and preach the truth. That's exactly where they come from. They don't need to come from anywhere else. So we need to understand that, and we're deeply appreciative, Brother Jim, that good 
presentation. I hope that you will get the book so you can read much more. I know that all three of the men who spoke this morning were under the burden, as we all are all the time in every lectureship, being able to get to all we'd like. I think we have a very unique book this year, not that you couldn't find this material elsewhere on your own, to have it all in one volume and to have it stated in the way that it is and taught and it's very thorough. I think that we would do well to get more than one copy and get it in the hands of other folks. You can get it this week during the lectureship for $17. At the lectureship, it's going to cost you, I think, what was it, 20 Is that right, Ken? Or was it 25 <laughs> I think we said it at 20 plus uh, any tax that you have or shipping handling after it's over with, you have to order it, but right now it's 17. And we hope that you'll see fit to do that. Let me mention uh, uh, matters this afternoon.